Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am so happy today to have my podcast, MK She Warford Robinson. Did I say it right? You got it, girl. I did. Yay. <laughs> we just had this great conversation um, off camera about how important it is to pronounce someone's name correctly because, you know, like it's just the right thing to do and it starts you off on the right note. And it's okay to make mistakes, as long as you, in my view, as long as you try to get it right. Don't Amen. just like brush it off. You try to get Amen. it right. Yeah, so I'm so happy to have you. I am excited to be here. We get to share energy. This is amazing. Right? Like I (laughs) as I as I mentioned to you, I first heard you. I was it Salesforce? Were you on Salesforce? Um well um, it was was BPTN. I know I did uh was it the summit? The summit, yes, I think so. Yeah, so so I I was on a amazing. Yeah, I was on a panel, but I also ran the side show stage. So I depends on the experience that you yeah. (laughs) Had. <laughs> and you were you were absolutely amazing and I was just like this lady I need to follow her I need to see what she's doing and um I have not been disappointed at all and I just need to understand before we get started the question where do you get your energy you're out there posting your video about you working out and what time is that like it looks early yeah we get up at four my husband and I get up at four yeah so uh, so is that a real question? You want me to answer that? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> it's God. It's God. I'm telling you, it's God. It's God. It's God. Your energy for me, at least. And mm. I, you know, what I would challenge people is depending on what's in your spirit, mm. it will let you up or it will, it will, it will bring you down, right? It can energize you or it can fatigue you. And so, you know, I really try to ensure that, you know, my spirit is as clean as possible. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that I'm moving from a good space. And so when mm-hmm. I wake up in the morning, it's like, I have no resentment for anybody. I have no jealousy, no anger. Like, you know, you have the, the bouts mm-hmm. of things that show up, mm-hmm. but they don't linger. They don't fester. They don't, they, they, they no longer encroach on who I am. You know what I mean? And so... Mm-hmm you know, when you get up, all you have is this, like, yes, another day, God needs me. And it's like, let's do this, you know? Um, I love that, that's you. it. Oh. Because I'll be honest with you, it's not about sleep. Because my whole th- my thing has always been, I, people say, you know, what time do you have to go to bed to get up before? I'm like, but that's the wrong question. The question should be, do I always get up before? I always get up before, right? Sometimes I sleep in, but those are intentional decisions. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I always get up at four. And um, and it doesn't matter when I went to bed. It's because I'm very consistent about the things I need to do in my life to continue Mm -hmm. to produce this energy that people talk about. And so for me, it doesn't look like energy because it's not all the time that I'm feeling energetic. Mm -hmm. But um, but I just have this love to light up, to to be a light to the spaces that I occupy. Wow. So we need to delve into this some more. So <laughs> I really need to talk about like, tell me about your journey, like a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into like how you got to be this enlightened because this is <laughs> empowered, empowered. Note that? Because empowered that in my skin, yeah. Um, That's right. So my parents are Nigerian. So I'm first generation Canadian. My brother and I have uh, one sibling. He's four years older than me. Uh, born to hard, like hardcore Nigerian parents, you know? And so they came over in the sixties and my dad's story is pretty interesting because he came over with the intention to get an education, then go back to Nigeria and help them build out their telecom infrastructure. Uh, He worked at Bell and after his, um, what do they call it? Like when you have, um, like now we call it like a co-op, but it was called like a like a stage back down, no, like stage, no, like know. a stage, like a work stage. Like you just, you're working for a period of time, like a two year stage where you okay, yes. uh, get Yeah. They invited him to stay mm-hmm. and, and he did him. My, my mom mm-hmm. made the decision to stay. They, my brother and I then became first generation Canadians and we only have two generations of Canadians in our family, actually my, my brother and then my nieces, mm-hmm. and, uh, my brother and I, my nieces. And, uh, and it was interesting because and I think you, 
I've been hearing it a little bit more, you know, as people have been more vocal about their experience, their black experience, right? Like, so I can, I've had to ask my parents, was that your experience? Like now I actually understand it. So they came from a country, Nigeria is the seventh most populous country in the world. At the mm -hmm. time, I was probably 13 or so, you know, 11 or ranked in the world, but it's a lot of people. Like we're talking about, you know, 180 million people now, na natives that are black, you know, that's all they, all they knew were black people, you know? Yeah. So when they came here, th there was no such thing for them as racism. Like they just, that was not something that they grew up or knew about or spoke about or knew anything about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, love it or not, my parents just decided that, eh, I'm just not gonna be concerned with it. Like, I'm not gonna let it, like, it's not gonna let, I'm not gonna let it affect my life. That's, a, yeah. that's essentially, they're not saying that it doesn't exist, but they're saying doesn't exist for us. It's not gonna exist for us, right? And they went about yeah. their business. And, and so what that looked like was in 1978, they moved, we moved from Ottawa to Montreal, the heart of racism in Montreal at the time. And they moved themselves into the neighborhood that they wanted to live in, which was a white neighborhood. And why did they wanna live there? because they liked the house and they liked the neighborhood. And we were the only black family and like four speckles of black. Some, for most people, the first black people that they'd seen ever. And so you can mm. imagine what that's like for kids, us growing mm. up. Like the school wasn't as accepting, you know, the kids weren't mm -hmm. as accepting. What was happening in their household was not preparing them for seeing people that look different than them. And so, you know, just to, you could just imagine, I don't have to go into details, but we grew up with a lot of bullying and racism and, you know, just disdain for who we were just because of the color of our skin. But what I saw and, and what I'll share is my parents never moved. They never changed their phone number, even though it was, we had crank callers. They never left their house, even though people would ring our doorbell and then pelt eggs at us when we out opened it or write, am I allowed to and write nigger on this, on our, on our white, like on the door. And my parents would just paint over it. Like, you know, and, uh, and my dad had a white car one time and we woke up to have red paint and he just went and got himself a red car. Like, you know, like, so, <laughs> and, and, you know, they never changed their phone number. They never moved from the neighborhood. But what I saw, what I experienced, what I, you know, even endured and had to endure and the disrespect that we had when people would ring our doorbell and be surprised that we lived there. I saw my parents' resilience. I saw their commitment to and their and their and their their understanding of who they were. The the world may think that they're somebody different, but we know who we are, you know, and we know our identity. And we are going to hold because th we belong. We, you, you can't move us, you know? And what happened was a diverse neighborhood grew up around them. So they're pioneers in my book. You know what I mean? Like they should be, somebody should write an article about them. Our next door neighbor moved in eventually. We're black. They had the Indian Jew cans. They had like probably 10 people, 10 black people living there. Our neighbors across the street were, were South Asian. You know, Asians came in to the neighborhood you know, white families adopted black kids, like, and it was an affluent neighborhood, you know? And yeah. uh, that's something to stand on the shoulders on, yeah. you know? And um, it's only later on in my life when, you know, this energy that you're seeing, when that, when I locked into that's my, wow, that's my heritage. Mm -hmm. That's my baseline. That's my truth. And so I, started, learned, I started to be empowered by it. Yeah. So you learned all this from just that. You know, I mean, I know it made you who you are, but it's a little bit of a harrowing experience. And I speak as I speak about that as someone who left Jamaica where majority of people are black and then moved to Ottawa. Um, and I didn't I, I moved there when I was 16. I didn't quite have the same experience because um, I went to a, um, a high school where everybody was Every, like there were only 80 kids in my graduating year. There were 700 students, but because Ottawa is the capital, I didn't have many incidences that, you know, of outward racism because cops and people like that don't know who they're dealing with. Like, are you a diplomat's child or something mm, like that? So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, there were incidences That's of racism, good. but it's not, it's not very like outward. And, mm. um, you know, kids, kids are just like, hey, will you play with me? Will you do this? Can we go out? Mm. 
have some drinks, mm -hmm. um, uh, iced tea uh, at 16. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, that's how it was. It wasn't, so Ottawa was actually really pretty good for me. It wasn't until I moved to Toronto and then I started to see, okay, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. seeing it more now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we used to go to Montreal on the weekends because Ottawa, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, and we see it there too, but mm -hmm. Montreal and Toronto is where you really, really mm -hmm. see it in Ottawa. I think because it's more of a, not many people are from Ottawa, you know, like most people kind of come in and then they leave, but um, yeah, you're, what you just said, I know it made you like who you are, but that's kind of harrowing to you know, have your dad's car painted red. And I love that. He went and got a red car, right? Yeah, this is a burning, burning Buick LaSalle. I'll never right? forget that. You know, I, I was saying, and the one thing I want to just share, my parents, like, especially my mom, more, definitely more so my mom, always brought me back to, like, this is only me now being able to under, like make sense of it, right? She always mm. brought me back to my truth. And so mm. as an example, um, I came home one day from school and I was crying and I was like, mommy, the kids at school were laughing at me. And they're like, why were they laughing at you? And I said, well, they, you know, I gave her the name and I said, uh, he said that grandma, no, that gr his grandma owns grandma, his grandfather owns grandma because I've met my grandma. I've been to Nigeria. Right. And she says, mm -hmm. eh, I don't know. Did you tell them that you went to the village and there was no white man in the village? Oh, nobody. Did you see any white man in the village? So go tell them that there's no white man in the village. So the next day with my, with my mom's, you know, <laughs> reminder, I'd go up and say, my mommy said that your grandfather couldn't be my, <laughs> couldn't own my grandmother because there's no white man in the village. And then I everyone's like looking around because they're just repeating what they know. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting here and I'm like, I've been to the village. Like there is no white people there. So it's like, <laughs> You know, and, and what I learned about that is you don't have to be conformed by, you know, what the world is saying. Know yeah. your truth. That is why yeah. I always tell people, like, know who you are so you can't yeah. be compromised. Because what happened was mm -hmm. I left, I, I went home that previous day compromised compromised mm -hmm. because I forgot who I was. Once mm -hmm. my mom reminded me who I was, I went back with confidence. So from compromise to confidence, you know? So do you think that the confidence that your parents obviously instilled in you, and I have to say, my God, I love that. They were resilient. They didn't even change their phone number. They're like, this is who we are. We're six not nine, moving. Seven, five, I still remember 514-677-7727. My mom's, my mom's number is is still the 7727. She just has 69. Hmm. Well, let me not put it out there. Yeah, no. not put that there, but yeah. <laughs> but then, right? I like, called her for some wisdom, but anyway, yeah. Right? But like, you know, like that is absolutely, absolutely impressive. And by the way, you said they were Nigerian. So when you moved to Montreal, did you speak French? Yeah. So I was born in Ottawa. My brother was born, oh, yeah, so I was born in Ottawa yeah. and I moved to Montreal when I was six years old. So okay. when I left Montreal, yes, I speak. So I still speak French. Yeah. I yeah. was definitely way more fluent when I left in 1996. But yes, I, I went to French immersion. I worked in Montreal for two and a half years. So I've worked mm -hmm. in a French environment. Yes. And, and your parents, do they speak French when they move? Yes, my my dad okay. more so than my mom. My dad still okay. to this day likes to, when I call him, I say, bonjour, papa. And he said, oh, tu, tu veux parler français? I was like, oh my gosh. Oh. Then we started talking in French and then I stop. And then he's like, no. You know, I was like, no, I'm, not, oh. I'm done. I'm done. Like this conversation is struggling. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. So that is absolutely um, impressive. And how was it, you know, um, working in Montreal and growing up and, you know, being like the only, if one, one of the few black women, how did that help you, you know, in your job um, as you were going along? Like, did it teach you to be more resilient, really go after you what you want? Like, how did it impact you? So I, I recognize now I learned a lot of that from my parents. Like just always, my parents were always about excellence, right? Like I... Mm -hmm. Um, mm. just always about excellence, right? When I, when I got into university in my first semester, I was fooling around and I didn't do well. What do they do? 
they took me to Nigeria for seven weeks. And of those seven weeks, I think four of them, we were in the village, right? Like, and so it was to remind me where I came from and to, to really instill the values in me so that when I went back, my GPA went from 2.0 to like, like, first of all, I had to like write to my university to tell them why they should let me back. And then after that, I just never had a, I never had a, G, a, G, a GPA below 3.5, you know? So, uh, mm. so, my, so I learned that resilience, I know from my parents, but I, you know, it's, it's, what I love about it is, you know, resilience carried you through, but I think the power of resilience is when you, you're actually under, when you, when you're aware of it, when you actually aware what resilience feels like, looks like, smells like. Um, and so, you know, to answer your question more directly, I didn't realize I was a black woman in corporate or in technology mm -hmm. until I was asked it late in my career. It was always about mm -hmm. being black. You know, like mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the benefit that white women have is, you know, you have to just worry about your womanhood. You know, mm -hmm. I was trying to just let people accept me as a human, you know, like mm -hmm. I think that that's been black people's struggle is that forget about, you know, being a black woman, you've always had to like first convince people that you are human and you deserve the, mm -hmm. the basic rights of a human being. Mm -hmm. And then you have, unfortunately, the added complexity of whatever other, you know, sort of diversity, um, you know, sort of diversity mark that you have, you know, and so for me, when I was asked about what is it like being a black woman in, in technology as an example? You know, I had to, I had to really, I remember that day. It was that I, I've said a number of times I was at IBM, I was on a panel, I was asked that and I was like, wow, I have to remember, I have to think about that as well. Like I've, it's never, it's definitely never been a box mm -hmm. I was in, you know? Yeah. And then I just made that decision that, you know what? I get it. Like I get women equality. I totally, and, I'm, and mm -hmm. I will stand for it but mm -hmm. I'm not gonna stand in it because it's never been something that I've even thought was holding me back. And so therefore yeah. I understand that it holds women back, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to let it be a marker that I now say I have to fight in. I am just, mm -hmm. I am running my race. And if you're mm -hmm. in my way, get out, move. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because this is the it. only life I have. But here's uh -huh. what I will do is I will stand in a way that makes it easier for others coming up around me and behind me, just so that their path and their, their pathway is cleared. So meaning that I will take the bruises. I will mm -hmm. take the hits. I will ask those tough questions. Like, am I being kept out of this room because I'm female? Am I being kept out of this room because I'm black? Or maybe perhaps today is the day I'm being kept up because I am black and female. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, so, I get it. Right. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. For me, like when I was younger, it never occurred to me that, you know, I was black. So this is why it was happening. I was fortunate enough, I think, to work at a company where everybody was type A, that's who they hired. And if you could help them get to that level, like, cause they just wanted to get to the next level. Then they were like, Hey, we don't care who you are. Just help us win. <laughs> and so I worked with a lot of type A people and we were fine like that. And I didn't start to become aware of it until actually a few years ago. And maybe it was just a naivety, but I was like, I, my goal was always to be the best in the room, yeah. you know, be the best, be as good as you possibly can be. Mm -hmm. um, because then you get noticed and then you get to the next level and then yeah. you do what is needed. Yeah. But yeah. it's always for me, like how, how, where do people get their motivation? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it was interesting because when people were like, oh, you know, you're like one of, and when I started in blockchain, I always tell the story and I've got some great pictures. I would go to meetups and it would be 500 people in the room. I would be the only black woman, the only black person, and I'd be one of five women. <laughs> and that was my life for like a year and a half. So that's how people got to know me. They'd be like, oh, Emma in blockchain, mm -hmm. you know, have the big hair, I'm black, and people, rep people remember me, right? But I never let that stop me from doing yeah. anything or going yeah. anywhere and everything like that. So I really appreciate your story. Um, and it's just like, I love that your parents really like that. They instilled, instilled that, that instilled in me. That. Yeah. And, I, and I recognize that I'm trying to also be that for others. And so mm -hmm. I, get, I get that being the only is not acceptable. So I, to anyone that's listening yeah. to this, I am not saying, mm -hmm. I, I cannot wait. And I said it earlier, mm -hmm. Today, I cannot, like, I have a dream too. 
<laughs> that one day my sisters and brothers will join me at the table simply because they fit the criteria of excellence, creativity, discipline, resilience, you know, um, innovation, vision, fabulousness. Like the, yeah. that, that, that's just the only reason. Like we're all at the table, like, trust me, that is my, but here's my thing. At that table, I still, when, when that day happens and I'm amongst my sisters and brothers that look like me, I still want to be a differentiator. I still want to mm. be the only in Keqing Waffer Robinson who is blah, 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 comma, blah, 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 comma, blah, 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 comma, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like keep putting excellence behind your name. So there's also the other thing that I try to say is it is actually okay to be the only. It's just, what are you doing with it? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and so even in a room where people do look like you, you certainly don't want to now just fall into the average. You don't want to be falling into the status quo. And so what I try to say is, you know, the opposition of being the only has created the opportunity for me to ma to amplify my only, you know, yeah. and that's what I want for everybody. I don't care what room you're in, whether it is a room that everyone looks like you, whether it's a room that no one looks like you be a differentiator, stand out you know, stand out. So really focus on your identity, your human. What do you bring to the room? Be ready for that day when that room becomes saturated with people that look like you. So you still stand out. Exactly. <laughs> Take me to school. There you go. <laughs> but it's true, right? Like, it's totally I true. I believe that. Because, yeah, I get yeah. it. Because if you're not focused on that, then yes, yeah. as we're starting to bring, because you know what happens after that? Then we fall into that, the victim of, um competition mm -hmm. you know what i mean of yeah. jealousy the spirit mm -hmm. that spirit but no but if you recognize that every human every human is uniquely whatever their combination of talents and abilities and and it deserves to be celebrated then suddenly mm -hmm. you're just in a room amongst excellence like that's the kind of room that i want to be in you know i don't yeah. want to be in a room where everyone is just kind of average and you know, and so, and then you're, you, you start to be open to the fact that it, there is 7.5 billion people in this world. There is space for everyone to, to be their own excellence, you know, mm. and you're more accepting of others because of their excellence, you know? So anyway, yeah. that's just, that's, that's my philosophy. I, I don't even care that not everyone <laughs> agrees with it, but that's okay. Cause if everyone agreed with yeah. it, I'd have to come up with something else that was original. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That was really, really good. So did all these lessons um, drive you to create like your company um, empowered in my skin and please tell people what it is and, and, and what you do. Yeah. Um, so empowered in my skin really came um, during, so there, there's a girlfriend of mine that really actually helped me. She brought my whole, she brought the whole need to really get to know who I am to the forefront, you know, mm -hmm. it's really just, you know, putting who, who this, the spirit of me in front of me and saying, Hey, do you like mm -hmm. that? You know, yeah. because I think we talked about that earlier, right? Like it's, is, is getting to know who you are means understanding who you are when the worst shows up. Cause when the yeah. best is, when the best of you is on mm -hmm. display, you don't learn anything about yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but it's when, when things happen, and the worst of you shows up that it's recognizing that that is actually who I am in my authenticity in that moment. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. and the key is if you don't like it, then mm -hmm. that's the person that you need to work on. Yeah. Um, just to, just to, you know, just to detour a little bit. I had a great conversation with like, it was a more of a mentoring conversation with somebody the other day. And, and she started off the conversation saying, you know, I just want to apologize for, who, uh, you know, um, from, you know, the last time we had a conversation, because, you know, when I was reflecting, I was like, that's not me. And so after she finished, I said, let me just ask you a question. What if that is you? You know what I mean? Because if you keep saying that's not me, but that person keeps showing up when the very similar situations happening next time, it's just going to be somebody else that's in front of you. Yeah. That's because you're not accepting that that's who you are Ooh. and that's okay. Like in that moment, mm -hmm. that was okay. That is who you are. It's for you to accept it. I don't know. There's no judgment from me. So if you don't like it, which is what I'm understanding from what you, why you are apologizing, then that's who you need to work on, not ignore it. 
and not say mm -hmm. that, you know, on that day, that's the person that showed up. That's okay. That's the person that showed up on that day with that set of circumstances that arose, you know, but if mm -hmm. you didn't like who you were in reflection, then that's okay. That's who you need to work on, you know? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. the power of my skin really came from me getting to that place in my life where I just wanted to be, I just wanted to feel good all the way deep, okay. you know, out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I wanted to connect with that goodness, you know, I really, mm -hmm. and that's God, you know, that's God that lives within us. I wanted to really figure, feel what, the, I was like, why not? Why not just see what it's like to have a relationship with God? People talk about it. They talk about it in very inspiring mm -hmm. ways. Why would it be any different for me? Let me just really try. And so that meant that I had to look at who I was when the war showed up, which is jealous, frustrated, angry, you know, resentful, you know, unforgiving. And, and I just started to, to just rip out the experiences mm -hmm. that were, had created that and replace it with, with another truth, which is love, right? Babies are born into love we learn fear and fear is all of those things that we call anger, resentment, frustration, jealousy, you know, and resentment. And, um, and slowly as that started to be what I refueled myself, refueled myself back with, I started to feel light, mm -hmm. you know, I started to feel like, wow, I want that, not just for me, but for everyone. Like, you know, yeah. and I started to feel empowered, you know, I started mm -hmm. to feel more empowered to show up, to show up in the best of myself, my highest expression and create amazing experiences for myself and others and, and want that back in return. And, you know, for free, like, just, just give it back to me, you know, give it out, give it back, get it back. And, um, and so I created, when I felt empowered in my skin, I created empowered in my skin. And, um, and that's my desire. That's my mission. I have a uh, a vision board over there that says the best way to become a billionaire is to help a billion people. And I so do my question for you. Real talk. You must have your down days. How do you handle them? What's a down day? You know, like you're like COVID. I miss seeing my family. I miss being able to hug my family. I miss being able to see people. Um, okay. You know, um, okay. people aren't the same um, as they were before. And now it, it's kind of like sometimes walking on eggshells, dealing with some people, yeah, you just kind of like miss things. How do you deal with that? So is that a day or those moments? Moments, moments. That's yeah. the difference. We yeah. say it so easily in English. The mm. English language is very precise. We, is if you call it a day, then you're going to feel you've had down days. Yes, but I, I deal with I, people I in China and yeah. I sometimes have to like be very careful how I say things because you know, you just use your like idioms and they're like, uh, no, it, it's not quite that way. And I'm like, right. oh yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is, and that is the truth. And imagine if we were more conscious of that, mm -hmm. because I haven't had a down day. I've yeah. had moments. And in those mm -hmm. moments, I might've reached for something that was inspiring and boom, I switched, yeah. my, changed my perspective. Or I called up a friend, phone yeah. a friend whom I know, you know, is on a higher plane, you know, maybe in that moment and boom, changed my perspective. Or, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, or allowed myself to feel that, that moment and then articulate it, but not keep it repressed and suppress it and keep it down. I had enough life moments that are great to know that great is coming back. You know, it's like, it's, it's that whole, this too shall pass, you know? And yeah. I, I also know that a lot of it is, is like, I get through it because I'm committed to live at my highest expression of self. Like somebody that mm -hmm. was here today was saying, my God, you have so many reminders in your office that just remind you, like I have a card that says abound, ab abundance is my power. I'm abundant. I'm worthy. I'm enough. I focus on the abundance of my life um, now and trust that every day in every way I am taken care of. Right. Mm -hmm. I have one that says, you know, I am disciplined. I am born to win. I'm amassing great financial wealth. Always do your best. 
be impeccable with your word. Don't make assumptions. Don't take things personally. Those are the mm -hmm. four agreements. From So I constantly have all of these reminders. I wear things on my shirt that, you know, when I'm looking at the camera, I can see positive words reflecting back yeah. to me. I have a prayer right here that always reminds me. It says, you know, God, thank you for, you know, thank you for your love and faithfulness today. Help me to live a life worthy of my calling to which you mm -hmm. have called me. Let my convers conversations be marked by humility, grace, and sacrificial love. I want my words and actions to reflect my identity as your mm -hmm. child in Jesus' name. Like these are, and this is my workspace, you know? And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's about having yeah. these things on the ready because I know those moments are coming. Okay. All right. So, okay. That's, that's a very good <laughs> idea. You know, it's coming. So you get yourself ready. You have your affirmations and everything around you. So when those moments hit, you already have you what you need to, around yeah. you to get through. The problem is we do That's not right. prepare ourselves mm -hmm. for those moments, right? Like as, 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 as morbid as this has sounded, there was a time where I want to understand death better because I hadn't had anyone that was close to me that had passed away. Okay. And so I would read stories like Madonna Badger who lost, I think five, I think it's five family members on the same day. There's a woman, you know what I mean? Like, and I want to know how does she get through that to be able to now be a thought leader, inspiring mm -hmm. massive amount of people? Because you learn through other people's experiences mm -hmm. and that yeah. is no different, you know? And so when we, the whole, the whole, the thing that breaks our spirit is when we don't have enough reserve within us or tools to, to draw from to be able to get through. You know, and that's mm -hmm. why you got to stay avid learner. You have to constantly yeah. reflect on the good. That's why some people say, mm -hmm. you know, um, like I get coached or I get counseled, but you're always so happy and blah, blah, blah. I said, healthy people need coaches and counseling too. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so it's constantly, you know, filling yourself up, mm -hmm. you know, filling up in those moments where you have the capacity and the energy and fortitude to do that so that when those moments come, you're like, oh, I don't need to panic. I already have mm -hmm. something within me that I can pull from. So here's my question for you. Uh, in a lot of people's eyes, um, you are considered successful. And in my eyes, it's because, you, and it's a well-rounded picture, not just work, but personally, and just your, the way you think and your, your, the way you live your life and your just ability. Like, what do you want people to know about success? I don't think it's a destination. Okay. I don't at all. I think it is a level of, I think it is an amplification of your gratitude for life. Okay. Right. That's to me is success, right? Okay. I think it's found in not what you have, but in who you are. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's about, you know, being, leaving a situation and knowing that you left nothing behind. You left a piece of yourself in that experience for mm -hmm. that is contributing to a greater good. Um, mm -hmm. Because, I mean, compare me to Oprah. I say she, you know, she, you know, and all mm -hmm. like you could say that she's way more successful, but I don't think so. I think we, I think the commonality between me and Oprah is we both have a really great heart, you know, and. Um, and so, yeah, so I, 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 I think it's incumbent on all of us to quiet, turn off the noise mm -hmm. and turn up our identity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And yeah. know that that's enough. Okay. All right. So people should know that's enough. And is there anything else you can think of to tell women or men or any people who like look up to you? Um, about life and, and, you know, going yeah, I think things. my girlfriend will be proud of this. I'm like, ah, don't look up to me. You know, I think, mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes we, we find, we fault idols, right? Like, you know, we can, mm -hmm. and I've, I've know because I've been there and I've, and it's through trying to prepare myself for certain situations of people I'm going to meet with, you know, mm -hmm. and always it comes back down to the simplest advice you ever get is be yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the key to anyone that's listening to this. My parting message is you only have this life to get to know yourself in a way mm -hmm. that, you know, you can, you can wake up every single day and, and deploy yourself to the world because you matter, you know, that's, that's my biggest message is that you matter who you are mm -hmm. matters, what you do, yeah. mm, but who you yeah. are matters. And it matters in, in, 
it matters in a big way. So become insatiably curious about the expansiveness of who you are and what you can do and what you can accomplish. Like that, that should feed your curiosity on every single day. That's how you wake up and attack every day is knowing that in, on this day, I'm going to discover something new and amazing about myself, you know? Okay. Okay. That's really good. I love that. I absolutely love that. So every day for you is a learning experience. Yes. Never go on sale. Be that Bentley, 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 Maserati. Like I know Maseratis never go on sale because I still don't have one, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't have Maserati money yet. But, you know, <laughs> but, but like, think about all of the greatest things. They never go on sale. That should be your, your human should never be on discount. It should never go on sale. You should never take that. Like those days off, huh? don't mm. take a day off from, from, you know, being who you can be the best of yourself. Mm -mm. Don't go on sale. Don't discount your awesomeness. You know, I want to ask you more questions, but I really feel like we need to leave it on that note. It was yeah. perfect. It was absolutely perfect. <laughs> There's nothing else that can end it this way. Uh, that was amazing. Love it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you, Emma. I really love good. what you're doing. Thank you for oh, thank amplifying you. voices that matter. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's great. This is a great platform. I'm so blessed Thank to you. have been invited onto it. Yes. I'm so blessed to have had this conversation. And I really hope that people who hear this, you know, they, they're able to take what they need from this and able to go out and live their best lives and yes. do what they need to, you know, to survive you know, COVID and everything else that's out there that life throws at them. And yes. thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. this. I love it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs>